Children of God, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know? Do you truly believe that God wants the very best for you, for your family, always, in every way? Do you believe that God knows better than you what is best for you? Do you believe that God hears your prayers, but is not coerced by them to do less than the best for you? Prayer changes things. We often pray wanting to change God, but in fact, the heart of prayer is to be changed ourselves to be more like God. Sometimes, with a clear vision of hindsight, we can see how God has blessed us perfectly. I had a professor in seminary who said, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy is almost always different than and greater than expected. God knows better than we. I'll share a personal example of that. When I was in college and in the first years of seminary, I dated a woman who I thought would be a wonderful wife for me. I prayed about that, that God would bless and nurture our relationship. And by the beginning of my senior year of seminary, we broke up. Well, that's horrible because, you know, when you finish seminary, you're supposed to be married so you can go into a parish with a spouse. And that clearly was not happening. In fact, it was a year and a half after I started in parish ministry that I met the person God knew was the right person for me. I may have thought the other woman would have been a good spouse, but I realized as time went on, she and I were far too much alike and far too competitive. I don't believe it would have been a good marriage. But God had in mind for me, Jean. I could not have a better wife or a better partner in ministry. God knew what God was doing. I just couldn't see it at the time. Sometimes we are blind to the blessings God is bringing about, and all we see is the agony or the danger or the frustration of the moment. What, for example, might God be already bringing about because of the social unrest in our country right now? Might it be that God is using the events of these days to change hearts, to change minds, to lead us to a place where we are truly a more loving, gracious, and kind nation? It doesn't seem like it at the moment. But God is always doing things in secret long before we see them in the open. The disciples wanting to know how to pray the right way, the way that would bring the results they wanted, I suppose, asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. The Lord's Prayer, this most familiar of all prayers, this template for the way to pray, and it begins with relationship. Father. Now I realize that for some people that is not a very good word to begin with because they think of their earthly father who in some cases is not a very good model for God's love. In my case it's very simple because my father was a kind and gracious and godly man a good representative of the love of God for me. But notice that what this is about is relationship. Relationship with a God who cares about us, who provides and protects and loves and nurtures. A God who will not stand far off from us. A God who wants to be right in us. This prayer, this Lord's Prayer, echoes the two tables of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hallowed be your name, we pray. Love God above all things. 
Your kingdom come. Your will be done. But then we also pray, give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who sins against us. Love God, love your neighbor. We are reminded each time we pray it. And the prayer as it comes in our liturgy stands as a table grace. We pray that God will help us to keep him hallowed, to love him above all things, to love our neighbors as ourselves, even as we prepare to come and receive Jesus himself in the bread and wine. Jesus tells us to knock boldly on God's door. Ask it will be given you, seek it you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you, he says. Confident that God loves us as parents should love us. Clearly, Jesus knows how a parent should act toward his or her child, and his hearers did too. When your child asks for a fish, do you give them a snake? When your child asks for an egg, do you give your child a scorpion? Of course not. Of course not, they would say. We know better than that. We love our children. And then Jesus said, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Is this a non sequitur? Weren't we just talking about the needs of our lives? About fish and eggs, about daily bread? Praying that God will give us those things that we need so we can be healthy and strong and happy in life? Why does he say, will not then the Father give the Holy Spirit? Or is this the ultimate lesson from Jesus that what we should most want to have is the Holy Spirit? Why? What do we get when we receive the Holy Spirit? If you grew up in the Lutheran Church and went through Confirmation, you no doubt were given Luther's small catechism, and you were asked to memorize the Creed, Lord's Prayer, Creed, Ten Commandments and all, and not only those pieces, but Luther's explanations. Do you remember what he wrote about the third article, about belief in the Holy Spirit? He said, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and preserved me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it united with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily forgives my sins and the sins of all believers. And at the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and will give to me and all who believe in Christ life everlasting, this is most certainly true. Well, what does that mean? It means that when you receive the Spirit, you are enabled to trust God. What Luther reminded us is that on our own, we will not trust God, we will not believe in Jesus. But with the Spirit, we are given that gift of faith. That gift that allows us to trust God, to believe that God wants the very best for us. To attach our lives to Jesus and his cross, and to live lives that seek to glorify God. What you get with the Holy Spirit is a life firmly anchored in God, founded on the rock, trusting God's promise. The promise is, that God will hold us lovingly as a parent in awe holds a newborn child. And is there any safer place to be held than in God's loving, nail-scarred hands? I think not. There is no safer place to be. And so again, Luther reminds us that God alone can and will hold fast that which is truly necessary I like this quote from Luther. I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. 
Sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus, God wants the very best for you.